So uh, I say these two things about running track and be in the martial arts for this time because in many ways I come from the tradition of the bodily arts and the things I learn go like this is that uh, the tremendous value of learning with a group of people when I went to university if I studied with a group of people or asked them what they were learning at that time it was tantamount to cheating what you did is you find, found a very isolated lonely place in the library and kind of poured your concentration into the work. What we do know now in lear learning theory and neuroscience is we learn better when we're with other people, when our nervous systems are rubbing together with other people. Okay. Um, I learned that you improve. You're able to transform yourself. You get better through practice. Those of you that um, play a musical instrument or ski or golf or play tennis, you know that. It's a common sense. Uh, I claim it's the same way about learning how to be an effective leader. You can do that through practices. And what you're practicing is to shift or modify your nervous system. So you're a different kind of listener. You're a different kind of actor. There's a way that you're able to move with people in a more effective way. Okay. Um, in the early 70s, I got my PhD in psychology. And I wrote my dissertation on what is now called the mind-body connection. Or in conversational space, people will talk about mind, body, spirit. Um, it wasn't called then, but that was what my, my dissertation uh, was about. Um, the title of it was the mind-body interface. I studied uh, language, I studied philosophy, I studied the nervous system, I dissected cadavers. I went into this notion of how do people excel? How do people move towards mastery? And once they begin, you get a collection of people who are living in the domain of mastery, that how do they make high-performing teams? That was my interest. And one of the things that I saw was that people had tremendous ideas about it. A lot of the ideas went way back to the, the Plato's Republic or the Abhidharma and the Buddhist psychology. And there was very, very little written about the how of it. How that actually happens. And throughout this day, we will be talking a lot about the how of it. You know, from my, my personal view, I think that uh, the first question that we happened that uh, Galileo and his group talked about is where are we? And they talked about where are we in the whole cosmos. And the next question is, why are we? And Freud and his counterparts started to um, uh, engage in that conversation. Why are we in the unconscious, and, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I believe now we're really in the question of how are we? How are we doing things, and how are we doing things well, and how are we doing things bad? So it's a very, very operational and pragmatic conversation that we'll be in today. Um, and the primary thing that I left around, that I want to bring here today around my, my work in a body-oriented psychology and my research there was the importance of moods, importance of moods and emotions. That uh, you can have tremendous amount of resources, you can be well connected, but if your mood is off, the way that you are actually being in the world, we'll all circle the drain. We'll all be off. Yeah. And if we think of action has to do with our muscular system, we can say that moods have to do with our organ system, deeper in us, our heart, our lungs, how we transport oxygen, our gut, yeah, in that way. So that's the, the notion of a body-oriented philosophy or psychology is the second uh, um, uh, leg of the three parts that we'll be working with today. Uh, the third thing is in the late 60s, uh, um, returning from uh, Vietnam and Laos, um, I went through India and I met somebody who I, uh, how would I say it now, it seemed like the, a very, an exemplary person, one of the most exemplary people that I had met. And I asked him what he did and he said he did meditation. And I didn't know what that meant, and he taught it. 
But what I mean exemplary is that he, he emanated a certain kind of inner calm or inner peace. <coughs> and at the same time, he, he did good works for people. He fed people, he built a free hospital. And so that combination seemed very, very attractive to me, and I had never seen that before. And um, so I said, would you teach me? And he, he said, no, I won't teach you. And I said, why? And he said, you're not ready. It was classic. And being a type A personality, I thought, well, how do I get ready? You know, and I'll do that. By the time I got back to him, I even forgot why I wanted to do it, except that I was on, on the search. And he showed me how to meditate. Right? He showed me how to meditate. And I still have a meditation practice. Um, uh, there are places where, uh, with an very old friend and partner, I do a meditation. We lead a meditation retreat once a year, about a six-day retreat. Um, but what I learned and what I'm learning about meditation is that you can manage your attention you can control your attention, where you put it, how you focus it, and the intention inside the attention. And that's huge. That's, that's basically the game, what you're doing with your attention. Most people in the world, their attention runs them. The thoughts that intrude upon us, the emotions that kind of ambush us, and then we're just acting out. If anybody has sat very quietly for any period of time, or you notice, well, what if I just sit quietly and notice what happens? You notice these thoughts just come. We don't even know what the next thought is. Yeah. We're talking about, thinking about breakfast. We're thinking about lunch. You're having opinions about me standing up here, etc., etc. One of the things I saw about meditation practice or managing your attention is that you can build that organ there is what I would call an organ of attention. Just like if you went to the gym and you did curls with weights like this, and you'd build your bicep, or if you did this, you'd build your tricep, you can build your organ of attention. And we do know that successful people know how to concentrate, and fulfilled people know how to concentrate. If you can't concentrate your attention, your ability to be effective is reduced considerably. If you if you're, can't manage your attention, your capacity to be fulfilled in your life is reduced considerably. So we also, with the advent of the new technologies of neuroscience, I'm sure some of you must be following it, but it's incredible. It, it really basically grounds all this work that we've been doing here uh, in somatics and body work, is that we know that what you pay attention to and how you pay attention and where you pay attention actually changes the structure of the brain. That's the price of admission. It will actually change the structure of the brain. How you pay attention and what you pay attention to and where you put your attention, the structure of the brain actually shifts yeah, throughout, a whole, throughout a whole lifetime. So if we talk, if we talk about action as being the muscular system, and if we talk about moods and emotions as being the organ system, we can talk about the attention as being the nervous system. And as I begin to, as I speak about these elements throughout the day, and we investigate them for ourselves, because basically I'm asking you all to be your own laboratory. So I'll say, this is what makes sense to me. And this is why I brought this into the field of leadership. And then we'll do practices and you can say yes, no, maybe I'm going to argue with you. I don't think so. I think so. You'll be the laboratory inside of this. But, but essentially, um, uh, the, 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 the new field of neuroscience has, sh has shown us that by, by how we organize ourselves through our muscular system, organ system, and nervous system is that we can be lifelong learners that we're able to coordinate much more effectively with other people. What do I mean by that? You know with, in every conversation you're in what's too much and what's too little. How do I raise the volume? How do I recede back and just be a listener? Um, how I can manage my own mood and, and, and ma observe and manage the mood of other people at the same time. Okay, so all these things are really critical in terms of what, what leadership is. 
common sense. We, we now know that people don't lead companies, they lead their, man they lead their managers, they lead their leaders. Um, they, they, they feel anonymous in the workplace. They feel like their gifts and talents aren't being seen and used. Um, they feel that in some way that uh, they're uh, not given the kinds of resources or uh, 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 community of support where they can execute on their promises even though they're very sincere. So these are the things we're going to be looking at. These are the influences of it. So what we say about leadership is this. A leader, you have to be smart enough. Everybody in this room is smart enough. Smart enough means you're able to hold multiple commitments. You're seen over multiple horizons of time. Right? You're able to hold multiple concerns. Okay? You have to have some level of expertise in your field. Manufacturing, healthcare, consulting, whatever it is. You have to have, to have some expertise there. The third thing is, there's a certain self that you're required to be. There's a certain self that you're required to be. And what I say is that this is your primary source of power. Wh who you are as a person. And I've worked in organizations where people have um, fought the same battles. They've gone to the same schools. Um, they've rose up together. And the, the difference that it makes in terms of their leadership and also their promotions is really who they are as people. All right. um, and what I'm going to say next is really where we start to, to veer off here into something different. And I claim that, that the self that you are is inextricably linked to your body. The self that you are is inextricably linked to your body. So that when you're cultivating the self, you can do that through the body. When we talk about somebody taking an action, we've watched them in their bodies take a certain action. When we, watch, when we look at somebody embodying a certain kind of mood, we see that mood in their body. Mood's not a mental phenomena, it's a bodily phenomena. When we watch that somebody has learned something, we see that they can take an action they previously couldn't take. We watch them actually do that. That's different than just data or information. That's important. But what we're about is actually being able to take the action. When we see that the way that somebody coordinates well with a team, or they coordinate well with somebody else, we actually see that in their body. We talk about dignity as being a domain of the body. We see dignity in people. Regardless of what they claim, we see it in the way that they present themselves, yeah. their deportment, their comportment, how they move with other people. 